It was 1865. The war was over and the slaves freed, at least on paper. The peace treaty was signed in the Appomattox Courthouse on April 9, 1865, and General Lee's army was disbanded on April 12. The South's long road of reconciliation had begun, and three days later, on April 15, the first seed of the race riots was sown with the assassination of President Lincoln. With Lincoln gone, the radical Republicans would be able to force their agenda upon the defeated South and race vengeance to take root. This video focuses on only one small chapter in a long series of turbulent events spanning the entire era of what is called the Era of Reconstruction and the Jim Crow Era. Many people are not aware that Bath, North Carolina was not immune to these troubles of race. This video documentary will attempt to shine an independent light on the events that took place in April 1895. John Wilkes Booth unknowingly fertilized an already poisonous ground for racial hatred with Lincoln's assassination. In addition to the radical Republicans' rise to power in the 1866 elections, the stage was now set for the growth of hatred. At the same time, Southerners feared this black political power and wasted no time by enacting what was known as the Black Codes a series of laws that were designed to continue to force the freed slaves to work for the same plantation owners and farmers. One Mississippi law required all blacks to acquire employment from farmers before January 1st of each year or be jailed for vagrancy. Other heinous systems like peonage rose up to replace the old slave system. Peonage was created when freed slaves derived loans from southern businesses and were expected to work off that debt Low pay and high interest were the tools to maintain blacks as indebted servants. Later in that same year, Congress passed the Civil Rights Law, which conferred citizenship on all freedmen and basically outlawed the black codes. Shortly after, they passed the Peonage Act, which outlawed that same practice. Newly installed Andrew Johnson vetoed the civil rights law, shocking the Republicans. They promptly overturned his veto. This was the beginning of a contemptuous relationship between Johnson and the Republicans. The Northern Radical Republicans were not done and would open the door wider for black political power in a very short period and would draw the white man's retaliation. At the end of the war, the North also had to decide how to tear down the old political system in the rebellious state governments of the Confederacy, and to include newly freed blacks in the political system. Thaddeus Stevens, a leader of the Radical Republicans in the House, worked out a plan to ban former ranking members of the Confederacy from voting or running for office for five years, unless they could pass an ironclad loyalty oath. An extension of the Civil Rights Law, the 14th Amendment, was passed in 1867 and gave citizenship to anyone born in the U.S., except Indians and visitors, also granting them federal civil rights. Andrew Johnson again vetoed the bill, but it was overruled with a three-quarter state's approval. The Republicans were frustrated with Johnson and nearly missed impeaching him from office by one vote. Johnson's political power was greatly reduced after this action, giving the radical Republicans, at least for the moment, the upper hand. In 1870, the topic of voting rights was addressed with the passing of the 15th Amendment. Now blacks would begin to build real political power in the southern states with the right to vote. The table had turned, but only for a short while, for as the years dragged on, the North turned their attention elsewhere like the Spanish-American War. 
The southern states were reclaimed by the Democrats and many freedoms initially granted were rolled back in the Jim Crow era. Real voting for blacks was not again achieved until the 1960s. These new restrictions and racist attitudes created more resentment in the freed slave communities, which led to a volatile mix where one spark could set off a riot. One of the first race riots was in July of 1866. Whites attacked a group of blacks parading outside a constitutional convention being held in New Orleans. Then there was the Memphis race riot of 1866. It was three days of racial violence, which was sparked by a shooting between the recently released black soldiers of the Union Army and local policemen. The next was the Tennessee Pulaski riot of 1867. A trade dispute between a freed slave and a white man escalated into personal threats. The threats became reality when the white man was shot, which sparked whites into grabbing pistols and guns and going on a rampage. The riots continued with the Opelousas massacre of September of 1868. Then there was the 1870 race riot of Utah, Alabama, where a large group of disaffected black Republicans were attacked by a party of white men belonging to the KKK, which swung the next election to the Democrats. In 1870 was the race riot of Lawrence, South Carolina. After the fall elections, a group of armed black militia met and engaged a group of armed whites. Next was the North Carolina Kirk Holden War of 1870, which involved the Klan intimidating blacks from voting. Governor Holden contracted a former Union guerrilla fighter to place Alamance and Caswell counties under martial law to stop the intimidation. The Reconstruction era, especially in the southern states, was dotted with race riots. Bath was not immune to all the racial tensions, and in April 1895, the spark was lit. The series of events that occurred on Saturday, April 20th and 21st of 1895 was put together with the use of nine newspaper articles spread over a time period of two years where the use of only one or even two of these articles would have resulted in a flawed and incomplete story. By the combining of all nine, a close approximation of the events can be determined in those two days. The racial powder keg was ignited by local police in the form of a series of misdemeanor arrests of a local black worker from the nearby RRR and L Company, a small milling company located in the township of Bayside, which is now called Bayview, located two miles east of Bath. After these arrests, the worker made threats against the town, and on the night of April 20th, about 100 black workers started for Bath. At around 9 p.m., the first stop for the rioters was a local pub named Smith's Bar, where drinks were consumed. According to newspaper reports, the leaders of the rioters were Thomas Bonner, Solomon Lanier, Samuel Clark, and Charles Stewart. The crowd soon became boisterous, and upon hearing the noise, Constable T.C. Paul gathered two other men and decided to confront the black workers at Smith's Bar and arrest them. A fight broke out between the two groups and Constable Paul soon realized his group was badly outnumbered and retreated to the inside of Smith's bar and locked themselves in. Two minor injuries occurred. One of the riders took a blow to the head and George M. Woolard, who was trying to arrest Stewart, was also struck in the head with a club. Both injuries resulted in serious cuts. More angry words were exchanged between the two groups and the workers tried to force their way inside, but failed. The rioters made their way down the street to Rackets, a local dry goods store, where there were already a small number of white men gathering. The two groups confronted each other inside Rackets, and the fight began. The proprietor, W.B. Ward, attempted to hold one of the black workers and was struck in the face with a club. Another member of the posse got a serious cut to his hand. This second group must have realized they were also 
badly outnumbered and forced the angry black workers from the store and barricaded themselves inside. On being forced from the store, the rioters returned to Smith's bar, and it was claimed they threatened Constable T.C. Paul and his men. They again tried to force their way into the bar, but T.C. Paul and the other men by this time must have been well barricaded. The rioters were said to have remained in the street defying the constable and his men to come out. Around 11 p.m., the worst of it was over, and the rioters dispersed. As the day dawned, the sheriff and deputies must have been surprised to discover Wiley Pitts and Charles Stewart still in the bath area, and they were promptly arrested. After the two arrested rioters were secured, T.C. Paul and Deputy M.F. Haskett quickly gathered ten men and headed for Bayside to find and arrest Thomas Bonner, the leader of the riot. Once in Bayside, the posse discovered two more of the rioters, Samuel Clark and Solomon Lanier, in a nearby undisclosed house. The officers forced their way into the house and quickly arrested Clark. Lanier was found to be in an upstairs room and Officer Whitley started his way up the stairs. At some point on the stairs, Whitley discovered a pistol pointed at him. He grabbed the gun and wrestled it from Lanier. In the scuffle, Lanier fell down the stairs and headed for the back door. Once outside, he ran for the woods. The officers followed and ordered him to halt. Lanier kept going, and T.C. Paul and M.F. Haskett fired on the fleeing man. He was shot on the right leg with a pistol and a shotgun to the left. He went down and was taken into custody, and Dr. J.T. Nicholson dressed Lanier's wounds. At some time in the morning, a call was made to the Washington Justices J.S. Marsh and T.B. Clayton. The judges signed an affidavit for the officers to arrest the leaders of the riot. Also, at some point, another call was made to Company G of the North Carolina State Guard, commanded by Colonel W.B. Rodman. They were placed on high alert until 11 a.m. Meanwhile, in Bath, another rioter named D.F. Havens was found. He resisted arrest but was captured and was placed in the Bath lockup. Later that day, around 5 p.m., the four prisoners were taken to Bath Harbor and placed on a small schooner named the Neptune, captained by a Mr. Bragg, and set a course for Washington, North Carolina. At the same time, the tug Nellie Bly with Sheriff Hodges and 25 armed guards also set out from Washington to meet the constable's boat. Another black man named George Whitehead with some alleged rioters also launched a boat in pursuit of these four captured men. Two other small boats owned by black workers were also launched from Bayside and pursued the Neptune for some time. All three boats, seeing that they were too late and their fellow black riders transferred to the Nellie Bly, turned around and headed for home. George Whitehead was arrested later that night at the home of David Bryant by Sergeant J.R. Grist. As the steamer reached Washington, the four prisoners were interned in the county jail and on Friday, May 30th, 1895, the case against Frank Clark, Charles Stewart, Wiley Pitts, and D.F. Havens was concluded and they received a term of 18 months in the county jail. George Whitehead received six months, Solomon Lanier received five months. Lanier recovered from his injuries and on Friday, August 29th, was pardoned by Governor Carr. In December 1896, Constable T.C. Paul and Deputy M.F. Haskett were found guilty of shooting a fleeing man, and Paul was fined $50. Haskett was fined $75, plus court costs. A petition was raised to rescind the fine, or at least lighten it which had no effect upon Judge Timberlake. T.C. Paul and M.F. Haskett then called upon the people of the community to come to their aid for the cost. The community raised $30 against the fine. Thomas Bonner, the so-called leader of the Bath Riot, was never found. It was rumored he left for Edenton, where he took a job as a logger after changing his name. A battle lost or won, 
is easily described, understood, and appreciated. But the moral growth of a great nation requires reflection, as well as observation, to appreciate it. Frederick Douglass Man, that's a long pier.